hell, a guy in his 30s today has a lower testosterone than a guy in his 50s did 40 years ago. So a guy in his 50s today has pretty yeah. low testosterone. And we certainly know that medically, it's a completely safe thing to replace. Um, and we know that there are great outcomes with respect to bone health, uh, with respect to uh, frailty and subjective many subjective yeah. findings, right? And we know that it's not increasing the risk of prostate cancer and heart disease and all the things we used to worry about outside yeah. of the edge case of hypertension, which can be managed. But all of that said, is there a case to be made that we should not be replacing testosterone in men because um, it turns us backwards in terms of this aggression and it's more likely to make that 55-year-old guy want to find himself the 14, you know, the, the 20 year <laughs> yeah, I don't old know about girlfriend. That. I don't know that that's been shown. Okay. But so you're saying, look, is there a downside? You're saying testosterone's great. Why shouldn't we give it to people? No, no, I'm asking the opposite question. Okay. I'm saying, given everything we've just learned about testosterone, yeah. is there a reason, is there a negative consequence to taking a 55 year old guy? and restoring his testosterone to what it was when he was 18. Why do you think he, say, make the argument for why that should happen? Why you should restore yes. it back to when he's 18? Yes. Um, so, do, you, do you think that should happen? I think it, it, it totally depends on the symptoms would be my take, right? So if a guy is having difficulty putting on muscle mass, if he's complaining of something, see, again, there are some guys who say, I'd like to have sex once a week, and my wife would like to have sex once a week, and that's what we do, and that's fine. Conversely, there are other guys who say, my wife wants to have sex every day, and I want to have sex once a month. Yeah. This is, now this is a problem. But if my testosterone is what it was when I was 18, I'd like to have sex every day. My wife would like to have sex every day. Now we're happy. Right? Yes. So, so again, it's, I, there isn't a formula here, but that's yeah. one example of how you're trying to match the symptoms and, and what the patient is saying to what you can do. Right? There are some guys who have no difficulty putting on muscle mass despite having a testosterone of the 20th percentile. It might be that they had, you know, their genetics are such that that was the case, or they put on a lot of muscle mass when they were younger and it's just easier to maintain it. Um, there's certainly evidence that insulin resistance can be ameliorated by um, right. hi by correcting hypogonadism. Right. Um, so anyway, there are, there are reasons to consider doing it. What I'm trying to get at is, are there negative consequences of doing it from a behavioral standpoint? And I'm not talking about roid rage and things like that, which has largely been sort of debunked um, outside of, again, these edge cases where people are taking yeah. sort of super physiologic doses. Um, but in terms of being a productive, non-assholic member of society yeah. uh, and, and not being overly aggressive or being, you know, engaging in harmful behavior, risky behavior, you know, what's what's the pro and con case for that in your mind? Yeah. So I imagine that the doses that you're giving, I mean, it's, I think, been shown pretty clearly that if men are within the typical range, even at the low end, you don't see a lot, you don't see changes in sexual or aggressive behavior within the normal range, right? You see muscle mass, you see differences in physical parameters, but not. Yeah. The most complicating thing that if, if I could if I could wave a magic wand, wave one magic wand in medicine right now, what would I have? I would have a PSA equivalent for breast cancer. Come back to why that would be a game-changing solution down the line. The second thing, which would not be nearly as important, would be I would love to have an assay to measure androgen receptor density. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Because yeah. what we can't, and what we, we tell all our patients this, yeah. and it's they look at us like, just measure it. And I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. We don't have a test for it. And they're like, how do you not have a test for this? Can you do the CAG repeat? Um, I mean, I guess you could. That would be, could. that. yeah. I mean, it's just, is there a commercial test for that? I mean, and you can do that in the lab, but. Yeah, I don't know if there's a commercial test. Yeah, like it, I would you like. Should, you I, should get yeah, it Someone should is. develop a CLIA approved assay for this. Yeah. Because Does everybody know what the CAG no, repeat is? No, they don't. Is? But, but I think the, the point I really want to make is, we don't know, like, why is it that one guy can have a testosterone of 400 and feel totally fine, and another guy can have a testosterone of 400 and feel totally depleted? And if you 
took both of those guys up to a thousand, the first guy would be like, I don't feel any right. better. And the second guy would be like, you've changed my life. Can I ask you a question about that? Because you know a lot more about this, I think, than I do. If you have the guy who feels bad on 400, do you eliminate all the other things that could possibly, how, like how can you sure. eliminate all the other things that could be causing him that you are going on in can, his world no, you can't, or in his body? No, you can't, but you can just body. change one variable at a time. But if you change that one variable, is that overriding the negative, potentially negative effects of inflammation or, or the depressing situation in his social life or whatever it is? T you know, typically tea won't fix a lot of those things, right? So, so you know, the most obvious thing you try to sleep, uh, you try to sleep, the most obvious things you try to fix <laughs> are sleep, nutrition, and exercise, yeah. right? So if a guy's, regardless of what his testosterone level is, if it's 400, which is very low, um, especially if his free testosterone is, is equivalently low, yeah. um, and he's got sort of these vague symptoms, it's like, well, look, if you're not sleeping well, eating well, and exercising well, like, let's fix those first. Or obesity, do you have yeah, to? Yeah, sure, absolutely, right? But you can't always fix those things to the nth degree without wanting to at least experiment, especially when it comes to body composition stuff or energy levels. So um, by making the one variable change at a time, you can sort of say, look, let's do the experiment, right? If your T is now 900 um, and we haven't, made a change during that period of time other than that T, and you're telling me, I don't really feel that much different. My hypothesis is you have a pretty low density of androgen receptors, and they're largely saturated at 400. Oh, and, interesting. And therefore, this isn't really the fix. There's something else we need to be looking at. Um, yeah. I just, I'm glad you brought up the androgen receptors because I think people don't appreciate the, the fact that uh, one person's 400 is not another person's 400 because, and I, I know you talk about this a lot about carrier proteins, but also there's the, the, um, genetic differences in the receptor itself, which is the CAG repeat, which predict the binding and the, the efficiency of its ability to transcribe, um, the androgen responsive proteins. And just the overall concentration. How, how where are the and where are your androgen receptors, and how uh, highly concentrated are there? Of course, there's different. It's going to be different in different parts of your brain and body. So all of that really makes much more complex the interpretation of a single measurement. Uh -huh.